Well, today we're in Matthew chapter 12. We took a couple of weeks break from our study, obviously uh, looking at Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. So we're returning to our study in Matthew by looking at chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 43 through 50 this morning. And we're looking at the question, Reformation or Regeneration? And you see that here in this passage. And what I'll do in a moment is I'll read to you verses 43 through 45. And I'm going to give you a, a context by which to view the, the comments that Jesus is making. And I'll do so by taking you through some of the things that we've already seen in chapter 12 that will lead up for us to understand what he's saying in verses 43 through 45. And then what we'll do is we'll conclude by looking at 46 through 50. And again, it's called Reformation or Regeneration. Let's begin reading at verse 43. I'll read to verse 45, Matthew chapter 12 give you a prolonged introduction, and then move into our study. Jesus, in uh, chapter 12 here, verse 43, Matthew says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now, as you know, at this point, the religious leaders of Israel, the group that is called the Pharisees, are plotting to put the Lord Jesus Christ to death. And the reason they've begun to plot to put Jesus to death is because they claim that he disregards the law of Moses. They see him as what is called a Sabbath breaker, and they also see him as a blasphemer. In Matthew chapter 12 alone, twice Jesus gave them opportunity to come to that conclusion. When we looked at Matthew 12 verses 1 through 8, uh, there we saw that Jesus had allowed his men to pluck grains of wheat and, and to eat them on the Sabbath. And that was believed to be work because the Pharisees said that the plucking of the heads of grain would be reaping and the rubbing it in their hands was regarded as threshing. And both reaping and threshing was prohibited on the Sabbath. And so they were upset at Christ because they said that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. Then he moved into verses 9 through 13. And in verses 9 through 13 of chapter 12, Jesus healed a crippled man in a synagogue, and once again he did that on the Sabbath. Now Mark also recorded this particular event, and I want to show you some things because it gives us a little more insight into what was occurring. Because in Mark's gospel, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Mark records, he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand, so they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. They watched him closely. So the religious officials were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. When, when Mark chooses to use the word watched, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word watched in the original language speaks of watching somebody maliciously. It speaks of watching with the intent to form an accusation against him. They weren't, in other words, simply curious as to what he was going to do. They were watching him intently to see what he was going to do so they might form an accusation. And so their hearts were impure towards Christ. And so they were watching him to try and find something to accuse him of. And then Mark goes on to say in Mark 3, verse 3, So he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to, to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do, to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So they plotted with another group of people to find a way to destroy him, which is what what Matthew had said in chapter 12, verse 14, they began to plan to execute him. Now, as we went through chapter 12, after that occurred, we, we saw his response. It was to withdraw from there 
and it was also to instruct his followers to not make him known. And even though he is now spending time attempting to develop uh, his, his followers and all, opposition continued to mount. And the Pharisees began to increase attacks. Jesus healed a man. He was demon-possessed. He was also blind and mute. And immediately the Pharisees said, well, he's doing that through Beelzebub, prince of the demons. Now, when he was accused of this, they became guilty of what is called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus made it clear that that sin is unpardonable. And because of their rejection of him and all, they would be condemned. They asked him, produce a miraculous sign. And he said, there is a clear sign that is coming. It's a sign of the prophet Jonah. And he speaks concerning Jonah being in the belly of that great fish. And he says, even as Jonah was in the belly of that great fish, even so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. And so he pointed to his own resurrection as the premier sign. The sign is his resurrection. He began to speak concerning the people in Nineveh because they had less than, than the Jews were receiving from him, but they, they repented. He spoke of the Queen of Sheba. He said the Queen of Sheba had heard Solomon and was impressed but his wisdom and his message surpassed that of Solomon. And because they were rejecting his words as well as his works, he said, you will be judged. You see, without his words in their heart, they could never be in heaven. In John 6, 63, he said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so he's been developing their need to receive him and to be born again. So with that said, he continues now to emphasize by making an illustration. In verse 43, that's where you see his illustration. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now he speaks of a demon, a demon that leaves a man only to return with seven other evil spirits. What is he speaking about? I don't know. Let's close with prayer and go home. <laughs> what is he speaking about? Well, one, it would seem obvious that it would speak primarily to those or primarily apply to those who were presently rejecting him. It would apply to those who are rejecting him. How do we know? Well, again, if you looked at verse 39 of the chapter, he says, this is an adulterous generation. And you look at verse 45, he closes it by saying, this wicked generation. So that would lead us to conclude that this is a, a warning that is being given against rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking to an adulterous generation and a wicked generation, a generation of people living at that time, but it by application could apply to all times, of people who are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and his message. The question really relates to, and we're going to look at this, reformation or regeneration. Reformation or regeneration. You see, it speaks concerning two different elements of the same kind of truth. So this can be treated as a warning against rejecting Jesus, but it also can be treated as revealing spiritual truth concerning self-reformation and the spiritual realities that are part of our lives. You see, he's making it clear that people need to be converted, not simply reformed. He speaks about a house. In verse 43, he says, an unclean spirit goes out of a man. He goes through dry places seeking rest, finds and Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. So he's speaking of a house. The house obviously would be his residence where he's dwelling. And the dwelling of that demon is a person. So he's speaking of a house, this person. And notice the house is empty. Notice the house has been swept. And notice the house has been put in order. So Jesus is making a, a statement that people need to be converted, not simply reformed, not simply cleaned out. It's a picture of a cleaned up life that isn't filled with the Lord Jesus Christ because the house is empty. And so when you look at the way Jesus spoke and 
uh, about a house. And let me turn you really quickly to another passage. Please turn with me for a moment to chapter 7 of Matthew. I want to show you something there. When Jesus spoke in this way, he gave us insight concerning what this house could be. He's already referring to it as a person, but I want to develop this with you by taking you to chapter 7 for a moment and looking at verse 24 and following. And I'll illustrate it this way. This is a picture of a cleaned up life that doesn't necessarily have Jesus filling it. Chapter 7, verse 24. And therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. It did not fall, but was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. On the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, it fell, great was its fall. So the house would be, would be speaking more of being the residence, and what Jesus is speaking about earlier when he was referring to a house is hearing and doing. It, it's not enough, in other words, for a person to go to a church service or to hear a Bible study, wherever it may be, turn on the radio or go to a, somebody's house and hear a Bible study. Jesus would say this, the, Bible, the whole Bible would state this, uh, it's not enough for me to simply hear, I need to hear and I need to do. And so if I'm a person who hears the word, but I build my life on something that's shaky, that simply because I heard the word doesn't mean anything. I, I could even start pu putting into practice some of the things that I'm hearing. I mean, Herod would hear John the Baptist. John the Baptist would say a lot of things to Herod. Herod was busy shacking up with, with his brother Philip's wife. And the Bible tells us that he delighted to hear the things that John would say. He would listen to him gladly. But the things that he said as it pertained to his life, his morals and the things he needed to do, repent, were things that he wasn't willing to do. And like I've shared with you before, there are numbers of people who like good Bible studies. They like moral lessons and, and, and all. But when it comes to them putting them into practice, that's not necessarily what they're doing. There are some people who clean their lives up. They will go to various meetings, whatever it may be, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcohol Anonymous, Sexual Addicts Anonymous. They'll, they'll go to meetings and, and they begin to clean up their life. They're, they're reformed and, and they'll speak concerning their, their years of sobriety or their years that they haven't used drugs and all. They speak about that. They'll get little pins for that and all of that. But, but what they're doing is cleaning up their life, but they're not being regenerated. And the Lord is speaking very clearly about that. And he's making it clear that our lives need to be more than simply cleaned up through self-effort. They need to be filled up with his Holy Spirit. You see, the, the Pharisees, if you want to turn back to, to chapter 12, for those who turn to chapter 7, the Pharisees were experts at outside appearances of righteousness. They were capable of doing the right kinds of things for the wrong reasons. Jesus earlier had rebuked them. He said, you like to give, you like to pray, you like to fast, but you do all of this to be seen by men. You're very good at outer kinds of things that people will look at and say, indeed, this is a religious person. You walk around and, and you're fasting, and he said you disfigure your face. You'll, sometimes they would put some uh, ashes and all on their faces, and, and you walk around and, and you have the appearance of religiosity, but your heart is far from God. You have the appearance, you know, as a little boy, and this could to some perhaps be offensive, but it's my testimony and it's what happened to me. So I'll share it from that angle to try and illustrate how sometimes outer appearance of religion is very attractive to a carnal heart like mine. But when I was a little boy, I, uh, you know, I was raised as a Catholic a little boy. I was baptized, re received my first communion, my confirmation. I was raised in a Catholic faith and all. And, and when Ash Wednesday came, I, I liked putting those ashes on. I liked walking around with the ashes on my forehead. I liked it. As a matter of fact, we would go to Mass. I would have the ashes put on me, and I'd have my mother take me to the store so I could walk around and look at people with my ashes. I, that's a fact. That, that's the truth. That's what I did. And because uh, I wanted to be seen as a religious little boy. Well, my mom was worse than me. I still remember <laughs> Mama. I remember Mama forgot to go to, to Mass to get the ashes on one Wednesday. And she got cigarette ashes from this. <laughs> that was my mom. She, she wanted... <laughs> <laughs> 
She wanted to be seen as a religious person. And, and some of you understand what I'm trying to say. Sometimes we wear our religion on our sleeves. We want people to see us. And the Pharisees were good at that. They would go around with their faces all sad because they were fasting, or they would give with great ostentatiousness, you know, so that people would see them. You know, they would stand on street corners and they would pray at certain hours and all. And they did it, like Jesus said, to be seen by men. So he's already spoken to them concerning the outward show of religiosity to get the attention and applause of humanity. And that's really, isn't it at its heart, what outward shows of religion are? It's the desire for the applause of man rather than the recognition of heaven. That's exactly what it is. Instead of wanting the applause of men, Jesus taught us we should want the applause of God, the applause of heaven, someone once said. And that's the truth. What did Jesus say about those outward acts? He said, from men they receive their reward. The attention that man gives to you is your reward. It doesn't have any heavenly aspect to it at all. You're not aware of eternal rewards. We need to remember that Christians are promised rewards that continue throughout eternity. And the rewards that God has promised to those who believe in Him and serve Him are based on faithful service to the Lord. And it's the Lord Jesus who gives the reward. In Revelation 22, 12, Jesus said it like this. He said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. You see, believers understand that we are saved by grace, and we enter into heaven by faith in Jesus. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where it says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So we know that we are saved through faith in Christ by the grace of God. We know that. It isn't the works that we have done, but it's the faith that we have in Christ in the work that He has done. We know that. But we need to also see verse 10 in the same passage, because Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So not only are we saved, but we are saved to serve. We are saved to perform good works. That's why Jesus in Matthew 5, 16 said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so you've been saved, I have been saved, that I might serve him. And God has already prepared beforehand works that I'm supposed to do. I am supposed to live a life that demonstrates the knowledge of God. And some, some fail to understand that though salvation is free, rewards for service are going to be given to you. Some mistake God's forgiveness for God's forgetfulness. Every believer's work will be made visible, made clear for review and evaluation. The believer enters into heaven, but we will have our work evaluated. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 14, Paul said it like this, No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive reward. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of Christians who say, it doesn't really matter to me about receiving reward. I just want to get to heaven. I, I used to work in this place that um, made drill bits for these guys who would uh, drill for oil and various things like that, and we had a we had a uh, huge blast furnace that was used for various things, and 
there was a guy that used to um, work the blast furnace and and you would actually lock the uh, the door on it. You had to lock it because it was it was just filled with uh, a lot of pressure. And he would light a burner. He'd turn on the the uh, the gas and he had a, a long rod that had a a a match at the end and he would slide it down the tube and it would ignite the burner and. Uh, we were standing talking to this guy one time and he got caught up in the conversation and he had turned on the gas and the gas started building up inside of this oven. And we were there for maybe a minute or two as he's standing talking. He lights the uh, match, puts it down the tube. When he put it down the tube, the gas had built up and it exploded when it explode, exploded, this huge door that had been there to seal it came off of the hinges, blew the door right off the hinges. I'll never forget, it was like a starter pistol in a, in a track meet. It, to me, it was like, go. And I was, I, I was out the door. I, I came in first place. I was out the door. And I still remember, because it exploded. It was loud and exploded, and I saw the flame and this is truth, I looked around the door to look in to see where he was, and he was still standing next to the blast furnace like this, smoking. There was, his hair had caught fire, and he's just... It was like a wily e. coyote. I don't know if you guys ever watched The Roadrunner, but... Smoking. And that's how some people are going to enter into heaven. But it's... But is that the way we're supposed to? Is that what we're wanting? No, of course not. Our desire ought to be to, to do something for the Lord because you see, God is going to try our works. He's going to examine them to see if they meet His standards. And, and He's going to examine the quality, not simply the quantity. You see, ultimately, He gives, he gives uh, the work its proper reward. And, and the proper reward, and, and that's what got me thinking about this, is because Jesus said that, that uh, those who do things for the attention of man receive the reward. Well, for the believer, our proper uh, reward will be things like his approval. It'll, it'll be his honor uh, to us when he says, well done. It'll be our, our, a personal fellowship with God. Matthew, for example, records in chapter 25, verse 23, uh, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That is to be your motivation, not just to make it in smoking as you get in, but to, to, to hear the well done from God, that the Lord calls you a good and a faithful servant. You see, that's intended to produce in us a, a desire to receive that kind of reward. Uh, Paul spoke of that, intending to encourage believers to be disciplined in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. There he said, remember that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. If anyone's work is burned... He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. We desire to win. Now, here's something for us, and I'll just touch this for just a moment. See, see, I grew up in a different era. I realized that. In the era that I grew up in, you actually, you actually had to, to compete to win the prize. You didn't just get a participation medal. I mean, you come home and you say, Mom, I won. You know, what did you get? I came in 14th. You know, I remember coming home from a track meet because I ran track. And I remember coming home from a track meet and I brought a bronze medal with me because we were in a, a meet. And I brought a, a bronze medal and I showed it to my mom and bronze medal represented third place. And so she said, oh, you, you, you got third place. I was, I was on a relay team and I said, yeah, we got third place. And we got a bronze medal, Mama. And she says, great. I said, well, this is what happened. There were four teams. 
and the first place team was disqualified. <laughs> so we got third place. I still have that medal somewhere. I mean, but is that real? I mean, does that really matter? I mean, let's face it. I mean, we were the last place team. They just disqualified the first place team. But a lot of people are like that. I'm telling you, there are a lot of people like that today. Well, I got a participation trophy, and they have a room full of participation trophies. Look at all of this. I was quite an athlete. Look at this. Was, this was my best. This is 13th place, you know. That's not how we're supposed to run. That's not how we're supposed to, to fight. That's not how we're supposed to compete. What we want is we want to do our very best. What we want is to, to, to do it lawfully, to run according to the rules, and, and, to, and to win that prize. And during the time of, of the writing of 1 Corinthians, when Paul was speaking concerning that, there was the Olympic game, but there was also what was called the Isthmian games. And the Isthmian games were very similar to the Olympic games, and, and he's speaking about the fact that, that you would compete and you would end up with a, a wreath. And the wreath was normally, you know, a lit, it was at one time a living plant that they would just make into a wreath, the victor's wreath. And the problem with that is it, it, it's, it's going to wither because it's not in a vine of any sort anymore. And it withers and it perishes. And he says, you do that to win a, a perishable crown. You, you do that so that you can show this little wreath that you want. But you need to remember that that, that, that leaf is going to dry up. Eventually it's going to just crack, it's going, it's going to be gone, it has no value, but we, he said, on the other hand, we compete for a, a, a crown that is not perishable, that never fades away, that goes on and on and on through eternity, and, and sometimes you think, well, what does that mean, eternity, and it, it's like if you had a bird that was able to fly and pick up one grain of sand off of every beach in the world, one grain of sand, the time it takes for that bird to get all of the grains of sand off of all of the beaches of the world and then to start over again. And then to start over again. Eternity is beyond anything that we can conceive of. That's why the word is so large. Eternity is a huge word. It isn't just something that's five years, ten years, or fifteen years down the line. It is without end. And I want to have a crown that is without end. Nothing that's perishable. A million years, 10 million years, a trillion years. Eternity is beyond anything you can comprehend. And he says, that's what you're competing for. That's your reward. That's your reward. And see, the Pharisees were very good at doing things to be seen by men. And Jesus says, no, that's not how we do things at all. In 2 John, verse 8 John said it like this. He said, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. The Pharisees were self-sufficient. They sensed no need for getting right with God. Being self-righteous, they saw no need for conversion. They had no need of a doctor. They weren't sick. But somebody said, in all true conversions, there are points of essential agreement. There must be a repentant confession of sin, a looking to Jesus for forgiveness. There must also be a real change of heart that affects the entire life. And when these essential points are not to be found, there is no genuine conversion. You see, outward change without inward repentance is what Jesus is referring to. And he's saying people can be outwardly reformed, at least to a certain degree. Again, somebody said, no matter how much a man tries to reform himself, he can never achieve the newness of life that God wants him to have in Christ. Although a man can make changes in his life, even positive changes, he still remains the same person and often goes from one kind of problem to another. Sports broadcaster Harry Callis once introduced a Philadelphia Phillies baseball player. Some of you remember Gary Maddox. Well, Harry Callis introduced Gary Maddox with the following words. He has turned his life around. He used to be depressed and miserable. Now, he's miserable and depressed. You can do your best to reform yourself, but without God, you're still empty. Now, there's a spiritual application that goes beyond that. Notice again in verse 43, 
When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, finds none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. They enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So he speaks of an unclean spirit. The word unclean in the original language, which is Greek, speaks of a morally impure spirit. So the purpose of this teaching would also be to warn people against cleaning up their lives without repentance and some spiritual realities that we need to observe. Notice how the unclean spirit is spoken of as going out of a man. The unclean spirit goes out of the man. It doesn't say how it occurred. Perhaps this is one that has been cast out by De uh, Jesus. Uh, it may be that he simply voluntarily leaves the body that it's inhabiting temporarily. Now, if the person that had a demon, if that person remains unregenerated, he can once again be possessed. It's like that old joke, if a guy doesn't pay the exorcist, he can be repossessed. I'll let you think about that for a second, okay. Listen, if a person is not born again, if the demon is cast out, but that person does not receive Christ's spirit, then he's still open to be possessed once again. Now, I've had people ask, can, can born-again Christians be demon-possessed? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 answers that question. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 16, Paul said it like this. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is another name for Satan. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. When you are born again, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Listen, that's a very important point I don't want to gloss over. I want to say a couple things about it. When you are born again, you become the temple of the Spirit of God. Religious practices are normally outward show. They're things that you do, and there are a lot of religious people who are actually living lives that, that you, would, you, you, you uh, appreciate. I mean, they're not stealing, they're not killing, they're, they're, they're not doing a lot of bad and all. They're religious people, but that doesn't mean they're regenerated people. It simply means that they have a religiosity about them. They're, they're a, a people who are trying to live good lives, and of course, we always appreciate that. But the fact is that this, they're not good in the sense that it's required. In order to go to heaven, God's standard is not that you tried hard or that you're a good person. There's none good, no, not one, the scripture says. None have, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many sins does it take for me not to enter into the kingdom of God? It takes a single sin. Because God's standard is perfection, which is why Christ came, because he's the only one who could point to himself and ask questions like this, which of you can convict me of sin? And he could say that to his mother and his brothers and sister. He could say that. And none of them could say, I remember when you. But of course, we, we are unable to do that. No matter how long you've been following the Lord, I still, I still sin, of course. Word, thought, or deed, I still sin because I still am shackled to a body of death. There are still things that I can do that are displeasing to God. Of course, I'm not perfect. And so when somebody thinks that they can attend, that they can become perfect just in their own strength, in their own life, in, in their own efforts, and even in this lifetime, they're missing the point. The fact is, I need a Savior. I need God to save me and to do a work within me. And so... If I do my best and still never fill up that life with the Spirit of God, if I'm, no, if I'm not the temple of the Spirit of God, I may be doing well, but I'm still open and vulnerable 
to the enemy working in me. In this particular case, you, you have somebody that is following the you know, rules and regulations. Jesus, in context, has been speaking concerning the self-righteousness of Pharisees, and he's pointed to that throughout the whole uh, Gospel of Matthew since first introduced to them. And the bottom line is, is that they're not going to make it without him, and that's a point he's making. And even if a person's life is swept out and cleaned up, it's still empty without the Spirit. So we become the temple of the Spirit of God who dwells within us. And when the Spirit of God dwells within us, then the Spirit of darkness cannot. What accord does the temple of God have with idols? What, what accord does the light have with darkness? What in common do they have? And the answer is there is nothing in common. Because wherever there's darkness, all you need to do is turn on a light. And when you turn on the light, there is no darkness. Darkness cannot coexist with the light. When you're saved, the enemy is driven out. But if you're not saved, you might clean up your life, but you're still vulnerable to his invasion. And so that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, it says in verse 43 that this demon goes through dry places. The word dry means barren or uncomfortable places. It's seeking rest. It finds none. It desires a habitation, in other words, but it doesn't find one. So in verse 44, the demon makes a decision. I'll go back to my house. And when he returns, he finds the house empty. That word empty speaks of uninhabited. It's swept and it's put in order. Reformation has occurred. A person's life is put in order. But what does he do? Verse 45 says he, he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. This isn't even the worst demon. There are actually others that are more evil than him. And what do they do? They enter and they dwell. The word dwell means to settle down, to make themselves at home. They enter and dwell there. And what did Jesus say? The last state of that man's even worse than the first. Reformation without regeneration is destructive. A self-restored person is in danger because he becomes satisfied with his condition. And because he doesn't think he's in bondage to his sin any longer, he thinks himself to be safe as well as morally good. And here's a, a fact. Self-reformed people are very often the hardest to reach with a gospel message. It's often easier to reach someone who is overwhelmed with a true sense of guilt. But when you speak to somebody who says, 10 years sober, 15 years sober, I did it myself with sheer mentality and determination, they are very, very, and some of you know this from, from experience yourself, they are very difficult to speak to because they have cleaned up their act and they're not what they used to be. And then they'll speak to you and say, you know, why are you judging me? I've done my best. I'm working so hard. And Jesus said, you're in danger because only the, the, the ill will go to a physician. Those who think they're well will not go. So I've had more experience of seeing people come to faith in Christ who are willing to say, God, be, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner than any person who thinks that they're doing well without God. Jesus spoke about this in Luke chapter 8, verses 18, verses 9 through 14. He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. So the righteous man is telling God all the good that he's done versus the man who wouldn't even look up to heaven because he knew himself to be a sinner the one who regarded himself for what he really was is the one God forgives. In verse 45, so shall it be with this wicked generation. They were living by man-made standards and they ended up in a worse condition than before. They had a false security, a false security. In 2004, some of you may remember this. In 2004, there was a tsunami that hit off the coast of Thailand and various other regions in that area. 
but it hit off the coast of, of, of Thailand. It's a huge tsunami. And uh, we went, we actually went to, uh, to Thailand and ministered in a place called Phuket, where uh, this, this, uh, the tsunami had hit. And as this has all taken place, there were different uh, videos that were taken of the tsunami. And I still remember one very well. As a matter of fact, I showed it here at the church. And it was a video that was taken by some people who were standing on a roof, a bit of a distance away from the shoreline. And they were taking the video of the wave. Some of you know this, when a tsunami, when a tsunami hits land, what happens is the water on the shoreline will recede. We know this when we go to the beach, and you'll watch the water recede when the waves are beginning to build up. Well, when a tsunami hits, the water recedes a great distance, and the beach that is usually covered with water suddenly has no water. But when that happened, there was a, a fisherman who was with a basket, and the water receded, and he had his basket, and he was going out to where the water originally, originally was, and with his basket, he was placing the basket down and picking up the fish that had been left behind, and he was putting it in his basket, collecting these fish, because for him, this was a great bonanza. I'm going to be able to take this, sell these fish, feed my family. That's how he was thinking. But these people who were on this rooftop, an apartment rooftop, were taking a film, and they began to scream. And you can hear them screaming uh, because the video was recording their voices, and they were screaming to the man, run, the wave is coming, run. And the man didn't hear him. And you can hear them screaming louder and louder as he's going closer and closer to the wave. And we're watching as the wave is building up. And it's a distance away, and you see the wave, because those waves will go 30, 40, 50 feet or higher. When we were in Phuket, we saw whole, whole buildings, you know, two and three story, that the water line inland, the water line was at the roof. And when that, when that water hits, it's not just a wave like when you're at the beach and you're body surfing or surfing. It, it, it's filled with debris. So there are trees that have been chewed up by the power. There are, there are things that are in the water that have been chewed up by the power of the wave. And it's, it's, it's like a blender. And so you may be thinking, well, I'll just dive underneath. Mm -mm. So what happens is you hear these people screaming, run. But it's coming at such a rate he couldn't run and outrun that anyway. And then you hear them screaming, and the screaming stops because the wave engulfs the man, and instantly that man was just chopped up, lost immediately for some fish on the shoreline. And I remember sharing with the church, it's like the church. That's what we do. We're in a perspective that we see the, what's coming, and we're screaming to people, run, save, get saved. Run, judgment's coming. Run. And they're just busy picking up fish, putting in their basket, going through life like that. The Pharisees disregarded what Jesus was saying. No, we're not sinners. We fast, we pray, we give. We're righteous people. And Jesus earlier had said, <laughs> Only the sick will go to a physician. The well don't need one. I've come to call sinners to repentance. People who will recognize that without God, they're empty. And no matter if they've been sober five years, 15 years, 25 years, if they don't have Christ, they're still in danger because they have reformed themselves without regeneration. They're not born again. And they have a false security. To emphasize this, and you're saying to yourself, are you going to teach verse 46 through 50? That's what you said? Yeah, let's get in that. <laughs> to continue this, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then he said, then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my brothers? 
he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here is my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, Jesus' family arrives. This gives him an opportunity to further illustrate his message. I want you to notice a couple things, and then we'll look at this practically and apply it and close. Notice with me that Matthew speaks of his brothers, and later he will refer to his sisters. In Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, the question is asked, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Jesus had brothers. They're named for us later. He also had unnamed sisters. Now, what's interesting is though raised with the Lord, they didn't believe that he was Messiah. John tells that, us that in John 7, verse 5. It says, even his brothers didn't believe in him. And so they arrive, and they stood outside, according to verse 46, seeking to speak with him. Why did they come? Well, perhaps they came to take him home for his own good. This had happened earlier. Mark tells us in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, that Jesus entered a house, again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. So when you have this idea that perhaps the Lord's family was just amazed with him, no, John tells us that they didn't believe in him, and they even went so far as to think he was crazy for the things that he was doing. So it's possible that they've come to once again want to bring him home. But when this is brought to him, when they say, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you, verse 48, he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Notice he doesn't say, and my father. What is he speaking about? If you do the will of the Father, you're his family. You are not automatically a child of God. In our day, in my day, we would speak to one another and call each other brother or that's sister. We would use that because the hippies believed, and I was a hippie, the hippies believed that we're just a family of God. We all belong together. But there was no holiness, there was no love, there was no self-sacrifice. We didn't have that mentality at all. We basically would use one another for whatever we could get from them, and we'd call them family. That's the way it was. So it wasn't real at all. It was artificial. But it did reveal a longing for us to belong to something greater than just ourselves. And so you're not a child of God simply because you were born. For as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe in his name, is what John says in chapter 1. It's the reception of the gospel and believing in Christ that brings us into his forever family. And so he calls us to have a relationship with him. But he says you need to seek the kingdom of God first, and you can't have your mom, you can't have your family before me. You need to have a relationship where you love me first, and then everything else will, will be worked out. When he spoke to James and John, you saw this in chapter 4, verse 22, and he called them to himself to become apostles. It says they left everything, including their father Zebedee, and they followed him. So there's a priority of family. He's saying, you need to have a relationship with me, and if you follow me, you're part of my family. My mother and my brothers are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. That reminds me of an incident recorded in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. It says there, it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you, the breast which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In order for me to be regenerated, I hear the word of God and I keep it. I'm not that person who hears and does not do. James went on to say to us, do not be somebody who hears and does not do. Do the word of God. And so, to be part of the family of God isn't to simply agree. It isn't to try hard. It's to hear his word, receive the promises to be born again and brought into his family. So he is inviting people to be part of his family. He wasn't rejecting his mother and brothers. He was saying, 
that the will of his father was for people to hear him and to receive him. And by doing the will of his father, they would be included in his family. So in John 6, verse 40, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up the last day. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And what is the will of his father? that I receive Jesus, the Son of God, as my Lord and my Savior, that I cease attempting to renovate my life, that I might in, 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 instead be regenerated by him, that that emptiness of my soul will be filled by the presence of his Spirit. And the more I try to make myself good, the further away I get from him. But when I say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, Forgive me is when I draw nigh to him and he draws nigh to me. In order to be born again, I need to require, it's required of me for me to repent, to confess, to turn from my sin and say, God, be merciful to me. Fill me with your spirit. And this empty, empty person can now be filled with God himself. I'm born again and the enemy cannot enter in and destroy this life because it belongs to God.